it was my first um, political passion. Um, many of the issues were the same as today, clean air, clean water, conservation. Um, given the tenor of the times, our version then of reduce, reuse, recycle was save water, shower water. scientific papers were being written about this, this potential threat of global warming. <clears throat> and now that threat has been fully realized all these years later, um, we're confronting what probably most people would agree is, is the major environmental threat that we have so far faced. <clears throat> How we respond to that threat will determine our future. And I think one of the things that Mark will talk about and that the FSP wants to bring to this discussion is to relate this, this, these environmental issues to all of the other issues that we face as working and oppressed people. Again, back in the 1970s, we were already talking about the environmental consequences of war, the war in Vietnam, and the, and the really um, terrible Agent Orange and other things that were were devastating the land for, for decades, uh, if not longer, to come. So I'm really happy to see all of you here on this, uh, what turned out to be a beautiful um, Seattle autumn afternoon after our rainy morning, to discuss these important questions together, to hear Mark and, and, and talk about these, these things. Um, the forum tonight is sponsored by the Freedom Socialist uh, newspaper, and um, we're having special offers, deals, if you will, which I will mention in a moment. But um, the Freedom Socialist is somewhat unique, um, somewhat unique, you're not supposed to say that. It's either unique or it's not. It's unique. It's unique on the left because of our feminism and our emphasis on the issues uh, of the most pressed. And um, the, uh, this is a very uh, special issue um, and uh, because in it is a political resolution written for the Freedom Socialist Party's uh, convention and um, amended and adopted by the membership that has a lot to say about eco-socialism and the threats that the planet is facing, um, as well as working class struggles revolt in the Middle East and, and many, many other um, burning questions. The, um, the FS has covered um, environmental issues since uh, we began regular publication in 1976. Um, some of the recent issues have discussed um, uranium mining and its consequences for Native Americans. And um, Mark's, uh, one of Mark's recent articles has been on the coal export terminals and the opposition that's facing them here in the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> the, um, the deals that I mentioned you can, these are our lowest subscription prices ever, ever. You can get um, 20 issues for $20, 10 issues for $10, or a year's worth of papers, that's six papers, for $7. And um, Gina would be glad to sell you a subscription or an individual copy of the newspaper. And I'm sure other folks here uh, with the FSP, if, if Gina is not available, would be equally uh, willing to help you, <clears throat> as would I. And if you already have a subscription, think of your friends and family. They probably need one. Um, what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to um, in invite a couple of announcements from uh, the party and radical women, and then um, we are going to hear from Mark. There will be plenty of time for your questions and comments. And of course, then afterwards, you'll be um, invited to stay around and have a drink and, and talk to the, your wonderful uh, cohorts here. Uh, so I believe that Gina has a very special, has a, an announcement about a very special book reading. Yes. Yeah, I want to everyone back. I'll use the 
microphone so you can hear me. I wanted to invite everyone back to the next Radical Men meeting, which is next Thursday, October 2nd, um, here at 7.30. And uh, a longtime friend of Radical Women, a local black author, Helen Collier, is going to be reading from her new book called Ms. Anna and the Tears from the Healing Tree. And it's a kind of magical realism tale, but is dealing a lot with uh, real life issues, uh, talking about race and racism and how these unspoken issues and this history has really affected relationships between particularly black and white women, but really affected our society at large. So um, she'll be reading from the book and we'll have plenty of time for discussion. It's a great chance to, to talk about talk about these issues honestly, talk about race relations and how we can how we can come together and find solidarity. So um, the 7.30 here, make sure to pick up a uh, bright yellow uh, flyer and we do have copies of the book available too. If, if and she'll sign them at the meeting. You can get it get it tonight as well. So um, I'll pass these around, and if, if you have any questions or want more information, you can always see me too. So I'll sell you a sub. We can talk about the meeting. Okay. There you thanks. go. And uh, Sue Dasical has an announcement. All right. I wanted to, uh, if people here don't know already about uh, Ms. Doris Salgado, she's a woman who's from Britain who's in Brisbane, Mexico. She's an indigenous leader in her hometown back there. Um, and it actually relates quite a bit to tonight's topic. Uh, in a lot of the indigenous towns in Mexico, the mining corporations are coming in and trying to get the land. And uh, the government and the drug cartels are all playing a role in getting people off the land. So uh, there's a committee formed here in Seattle uh, with her family, and uh, we meet the first and third Saturdays. Uh, there's information on this flyer, and tonight what I'd like people to do is, on August 21st, we have an international day of protest, and we're getting petitions to the president of Mexico signed to send to him for demanding her release, and we're going to send them in at the end of the month, so this is everybody's last chance. If you haven't had a chance to sign it, please do so. And here's flyers, and if you want to know more, we mark the afterwards. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, although the event tonight is to benefit the newspaper, um, we always, uh, at our uh, meetings and events, um, also fundraise for the uh, local party branch, which is how we keep going and produce all these wonderful leaflets and get involved in these campaigns. Uh, Megan will sell you raffle tickets, and one of the prizes is a um, almost one of a kind item, uh, which is a, a FS Freedom Social T-shirt that says uh, "Melt the Borders, Not the Planet," and there's several other beautiful or fun items there. So uh, Megan will be happy to sell you raffle tickets. And now for our main business. Mark Drummond is the assistant organizer for the local branch of the party. And um, he is an environmentalist from Kansas, uh, where he worked with something called the Great Plains Alliance for Clean Energy, or GPACE. And interestingly enough, I guess not surprisingly, um, what they were doing is fighting a coal exporting terminal. Uh, there in Kansas. Um, today he works in uh, research at the University of Washington on what I think is very interesting, STD vaccine research. And he is a unionist, a member of SEIU um, 775. And, we say that again? 925, Nine, okay. Um. It's always good to have at least one correction. Um, and he is the author of this pamphlet, which you can find along with many other wonderful things in our uh, bookstore. Um, and 
Oh, I wanted to say that if you want to read more um, articles that the Freedom Socialist has written about environmental issues and other issues, um, go to www.socialism.com, which we, you will find a tre treasure trove of those, of those articles. Um, so here is Mark. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you all for coming out tonight um, for our discussion on the uh, on the climate crisis that's already upon us. Uh, we've all heard the climate scientists' dire predictions that Mother Earth uh, always seems to one up. I remember just a few years ago, climate change was a back burner issue. Certainly not something that mainstream media and the uh, political parties were were interested in addressing seriously. But since Hurricane Katrina, the mood has shifted. The catastrophic loss of snowpack on the Greenland and West Ant Antarctic ice sheets confirmed our worst fears. Punishing storms, hurricanes, cyclones, and typhoons have hit far away and close to home. Extreme doubt, the likes of which haven't been seen in generations, threatened vast swaths of each, or each and every continent. And yet, our political, social, and cultural leaders uh, haven't lifted a finger to solve this crisis. They so blindly and so completely believe in the profit system that they are willing to deny reality, even when it's right in their faces, even if it means sentencing their own people to death in order to keep the system going for as long as possible. There are many factors which drive climate change, but the root cause is clear. Capitalism's bloodlust for profit is the underlying force uh, that driving, capital, or driving climate change. Fossil fuel companies recklessly drive, uh, excuse me, fossil fuel companies reckless drive to extract as much wealth as possible from the planet and its people, left unchecked and even encouraged by some, has radically changed the planet. They plan to burn every barrel of oil, every tank of natural gas, every ounce of coal, and their iron grip on the world's government and economy make that possible. This Mad Max scenario calls for radical solutions, and that's what eco-socialism is. The Freedom Socialist Party believes that in order to stop climate change and create an alternative to fossil fuels, we must overthrow capitalism and replace it with socialism. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the reason socialism is the only answer to this crisis is that there's a basic difference between the two economic systems. Capitalism relies on markets that run on the profit motive. Uh, goods and services are produced only if there's a profit to be made in doing so. And capitalist enterprises will continue to produce that good even if it's dangerous, as long as there's profit to be made. Socialism, on the other hand, is a system of democratically planned production with the goal of responding to and providing for the needs of all people. And what's more basic than a clean, safe, and habitable planet? If we, the working class, were in power, we would not choose to render our one and only in, uh, we would not choose to render our one and only planet uninhabitable in exchange for a pile of green money. Or green paper. <laughs> if, the world's uh, if the world's working class majority had the levers of state power and the resources of la the largest corporations under its command, we would choose a very, very different future than what the capitalists have planned for us. Under socialism, advances in, in science and technology will be freed from the prison of the patent office and the best ideas put to use in the service of the people the planet, and all living things. Advances in renewable and clean energy uh, production would be in implemented because they are good ideas that help people and preserve the planet. Natural farming techniques would supplant our reliance on poisonous chemical fertilizers and GMOs. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't mean a return to the 1800s. We have the technology and the know-how to produce more than enough food without harming the environment. For decades, and especially since the 2008 crisis, thousands of family farms have been gobbled up by the banks and sold off to large agribusinesses. Uh, 
This private ownership of the best farmland owned by uh, mega corporations is holding us back from the opportunity to revive, revitalize our farmlands and produce enough healthy natural food for all. Under socialism, Communally, uh, communally owned and democratically planned production uh, of food and, and the distribution of that food uh, would allow us to feed everyone. Another giant waste of our collective labor and resources is war. We are told by capitalist politicians that we are locked in a battle of good versus evil and we must shoot <laughs> and bomb all the evildoers in the world to spread Democracy? <laughs> what a load of bullshit. Uh, uh, wars, especially since the collapse of the Soviet Union, have been primarily fought over resources and capitalist markets, not ideology. Under capitalism, the ruling class forces the world to accept this vicious imperialism. As the German military strategist and philosopher Karl von Clausewitz famously declared, War is merely the continuation of policy by other means. The world's nations use endless war as a means to carry out uh, capitalist policy. That is, the repression of populations and the exploitation of labor and natural resources in order to lay ever larger profits at the feet of their capitalist rulers. <laughs> A side effect of the U.S. war machine being the largest purveyor of violence on the planet is that it is also the largest consumer of fossil fuels. We, it's truly ironic that we burn oil so we can fight wars for more oil. True peace cannot come about under capitalism because its drive for profit above all else inevitably leads to war. In order to end war and the colossal amount of fossil fuels burnt in order to wage it, the working class must replace imperialist war with the class war. Upending the capitalist order and replacing it with socialism is the only way to put an end to capitalist war, dismantle the Pentagon, and redirect military spending towards building renewable energy sources and mass public transit. But, <laughs> to achieve this, uh, you know, first we'll need to build a broad movement which links all the struggles for social, economic, and ecological justice and directly confronts capitalism as the problem. Thankfully, a solid foundation has already been laid for us. Public consciousness of a looming economic catastrophe isn't new. Karl Marx, the father of modern socialism and the author of the Communist Manifesto, wrote about the inevitable decline of the environment under capitalism back in the mid-1800s. Back then, he already saw that capitalism was disrupting the ecosystem's balance. Before and since, scientists warned that, climate, er, that carbon and chemical pollution and poor agricultural practices were threatening this balance. But it was only in the last 50 years that the environmental movement has really been on the move. In 1962, nature author Rachel Carson published Silent Spring and became a national figure for exposing the environmental and human costs of pesticide use and the lies that American people were told by corporations and the government about these chemicals. Um, Andrea mentioned Agent Orange being used in the, in the Vietnam War, and this was one of the chemicals that this book uh, led to uh, being banned. Um, the, uh, the book was widely published and thrust environmental issues in, uh, into the forefront of the American consciousness and became a rallying point for the fledgling environmental movement. Although she was never public about her politics because of the threat of McCarthyism, we can be sure that Carson was indeed an anti-capitalist. Uh, not only did she criticize chemical companies for their brazen destruction of the environment uh, for, for profit, but she also called out the scientific community for its close ties with industry, saying, the screening of basic truth is done to serve God, the gods of profit and production. Since then, the environmental movement has exploded in growth and is currently divided into two camps. 
The first and most visible is the NGO-led movement made up of liberal groups which believe that the climate crisis can be addressed through governmental means such as uh, reforms and, and government action. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right, yeah. The, uh, the other, less visible uh, side of the, of the movement is a hodgepodge of grassroots organizations that work outside the system. These groups generally don't trust the government or corporations to make meaningful changes, so they organize resistance from below and take the fight directly to those who profit from pollution. NGOs proliferated, uh, by the way, that's non-governmental associations, proliferated in America following the ebb of so the social movements of the 1960s and 70s. Grassroots movements that raised their own money and elected their own leaders were displaced by large NGOs funded by foundations and grants with appointed boards of directors. Under the banner of the environmental movement, the, the NGOs sell the idea that capitalism can be reformed to be environmentally friendly. They run on money, and that money usually comes from rich donors and corporate grants, which severely limits their message and the actions that they can take, because if a donor doesn't like what they're doing, they can always pull the funding. These groups distribute petitions, send letters and emails to officials, and stage what I call photo op protests to put pressure on politicians. Last Sunday's huge cli uh, People's Climate March in New York is an example of these NGOs in, at, at work. While they made sure to get many diverse groups to attend, and in fact our comrades in New York did attend, they, they, the NGOs tightly controlled the march's organizing and message to stage a 300,000 person photo op to pressure the UN to act on climate change. However, the march didn't go by the UN's headquarters, nor did it go by the climate changers' headquarters on, New, on Wall Street. Instead, the march had no political demands other than climate action and took people along a route that deliberately did not confront the ruling class. Green NGOs politely ask politicians to adopt green policies like carbon trading, carbon offsets, uh, private investment in clean energy, and holding polluting companies accountable through the courts. <laughs> They try to get their, their quote, <laughs> candidates elected uh, so that the government will respond to their issue. They, they idealize nonviolent protest and go to great lengths to keep other issues out of the movement to remain respectable in the eyes of these politicians. Issues like environmental racism, anti-colonialism, eco-feminism, and eco-socialism. This has led many to criticize the environmental movement as a whites-only movement, but that's just not the case. The most effective grassroots organizations that are, are those that connect the struggles against racism, sexism, colonialism, and capitalism to the fight for climate justice. Not satisfied with signing petitions online and attending photo ops, they, they take the fight to, directly to the climate changers. Through community organizing and coalition building, they build diverse organizations that confront polluters and disrupt business as usual. Women's leadership is at the forefront of the fight for climate justice. Ecofeminist fighters who uh, connect capitalism's oppression of women to its oppression of nature struggle for a better future because they're the ones most affected by climate change. 70% of the world's poor are women, and it is the poor that will be most hurt by climate change and the least able to adapt to it. <coughs> Grassroots organizations were on display the day after New York's People's Climate March. Uh, last Monday, th uh, 1,000 protesters, people of all colors, all genders, indigenous people, and immigrants, participated in the flood Wall Street action by descending on Wall Street and calling for the institutions that profit from fossil fuels to be shut down. Over a hundred activists were arrested in a sit-in and the protests shut down several blocks around Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> Now, imagine how different that would have been if 300,000 people had been there. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, the, the activists called, the activists or, the, who organized the action called out capitalism as the root cause of the climate crisis uh, as, quote, an economic system based on the exploitation, uh, I'm sorry, based on exploiting frontline communities, workers, and natural resources. Frontline communities are those that live on or near the land where energy companies extract resources. They bear the effect of mining, fracking, and mountaintop removal. Contaminated waterways, aquifers, and wells, toxic fumes, earthquakes, mudslides, and cancer epidemics uh, are all over the place in, in these frontline communities. Native Americans in the US, First Nations people in Canada, and indigenous peoples in Mexico make up the bulk of frontline communities. While the big green NGOs have turned a blind eye to these struggles, indigenous people have organized and fought back. In the US, they partner with non-natives in grassroots groups like Tar Sands Blockade in Utah, where the, the first uh, Tar Sands pit in the US was opened earlier this year, I think. Uh, and, and also in the Great Plains Tar Sands Resistance in Oklahoma and Texas. They physically disrupt the extraction process by chaining their bodies to bulldozers and excavators, uh, blockading caravans of equipment being transported to excavation sites, and organizing communities to stand up to the institutions that fund energy, uh, energy companies. The uh, indigenous Mexicans have formed community police forces and self-defense forces to wage an armed struggle against the drug cartels who are supplied with weapons by the US and force people off their land so multinational corporations can strip mine for gold and other precious metals. The Mexican government has responded by jailing the movement's most prominent leaders, such as Nestora Salgado, which Sue mentioned, and Dr. Jose Manuel uh, Mireles. But the government's efforts haven't uh, caused the people to back down, and the movement for self-defense is, is spreading throughout Mexico. The Freedom Socialist Party, in collaboration with its partners in the Committee for Revolutionary International Recruitment, uh, led the movement to agitate for the release of these two leaders and all political prisoners in Mexico and for economic and political democracy for indigenous Mexicans. We're making progress and the movement is growing in concert with the indigenous self-defense movement. To the north, Canada's First Nations launched the Idle No More movement in 2012 to demand enforcement of their treaties and respect for their lands. Ariel Deranger of the Athabasca Chippewyan First Nations in Alberta, Canada issued a call for action saying, quote, our people and our mother earth can no longer afford to be economic hostages in the race to industrialize our homelands. It's time for our people to rise up and take back our role as caretakers and stewards of the land, end quote. First Nations leaders show their commitment to ecofeminism by including women at the decision table, and they have no respect for neoliberal development on their lands. By practicing their traditions, they organize their communities to stand up to tar sands extraction and pipelines across Canada. Now I'd like to discuss the stereotypes of environment versus jobs. You know, th a lot of noise been, has been made about this issue, but unions and labor activists have been on the forefront of giving their members a voice and protecting them from environmental hazards on the job. Migrant farm workers struggling for union recognition rose up in the 1960s against toxic pesticides in the fields. Union workers, at, uh, union workers at nuclear facilities have blown the whistle on nuclear contamination uh, and its effects on residents and have been successful in holding corporations accountable in many instances, but some workers have paid for it with their lives. Karen Silkwood, who worked at a nuclear fuel plant in Ohio, was murdered in 1974 in an effort to cover up numerous violations of health regulations she had investigated as part of her union's bargaining committee. 
Judy Berry, a feminist, labor leader and organizer with Earth First, organized solidarity between eco-activists and union workers to end logging in California's redwood forests. She too was targeted for assassination. In 1990, a car bomb was placed in her car and exploded with her in it. Uh, luckily, she uh, didn't die in the blast, but she was severely injured um, and was, had to cut back her activities. Barry's legacy lives on in the organizing to link workers' struggles to environmental issues. The International Brotherhood of Teamsters took up this mantle in 1999 at the World Trade Organization protests in Seattle by organizing with environmental groups for a Teamsters and Turtles contingent in the protest. <laughs> However, some conservative union leaders, particularly in the construction trades, fall into the trap that corporations lay for them. With unionization at an all-time low, Corporations that are usually averse to unions suddenly offer jobs to the, to the unions. They hope that by luring the union in, they will spoil any attempts at solidarity with the environmentalists and split the movement against the destructive activities. We need to counter these actions with demands that speak to the workers themselves, like nationalization of the energy companies under worker and community control, massive investment in renewable energy, and for retraining programs for workers in new technologies. Yeah. I want one of those jobs. <laughs> um, unions and grassroots organizations are effective because they are, they are made up of and led by the people who are most affected by resource extraction, pollution, and climate change. Since the 1960s, African Americans have led struggles in their communities against refineries, incinerators, garbage dumps, toxic waste facilities, and oil pipelines that were put there intentionally and put, built there intentionally by, uh, in those communities by corporations. Many of the leaders fight the, this environmental racism I'm sorry, many of the leaders who fight this environmental racism come out of the civil came out of the civil rights movement and brought the same tactics used in those historic freedom struggles. In the aftermath of Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy, which hit poor communities of color the hardest, it was grassroots organizations in those communities that provided the most relief for victims. It should be a concern how little help the federal and state governments were in these disasters. In New Orleans, the National Guard was sent in not to search for survivors, but to protect the property of business owners. Images of guardsmen gunning down people of color as they scavenge for food and water are burned into our national psyche. And after the floodwaters had retreated, the government used the disaster to realize numerous neoliberal dreams like charter schools and privatized public services. In New York, the feds airdropped supplies in and said, good luck. Thankfully, <laughs> the, this was after the Occupy Wall Street movement and the grassroots sprang into action. Freedom Socialist Party and Radical Women members in New York uh, and the surrounding area distributed supplies to stranded survivors alongside groups like Occupy Sandy. The iconic picture of a public hospital without electricity directly next to a lit up Go Goldman Sachs building said it all. The response of the government and corporations to these disasters shows us, shows us what's in store for us if the, in the future, or in a future which climate change induced super hurricanes wreck coastal cities, drought forces mass migration, and farmland dries up. The, the world will, will descend into barbarism, where democracy is a thing of the past and only the strongest survive. We need to act now to change this trajectory to one that values and respects all life. This can be done by recognizing that our interconnected issues necessitate a united movement. 
To truly solve the climate crisis, we need to replace capitalism with a sane system of organizing the production and distribution of our needs based on inclusive democratic decision making. That's made, and that's the promise of socialism. We must start by respecting and valuing the leadership of indigenous peoples, women, and workers. The Freedom Socialist Party calls for a united front. A true united front differs from most coalitions in America in that it has working class leadership, not one that will hand over control to the people who will subvert militancy and keep the effort confined within the Democratic Party or other reformist channels. It's also democratic, with participants showing each other respect despite their differences. FSP believes that if the United Front begins with honest debate about the political basis of unity, we will find the strongest common ground and become a fighting force. It is not necessary for groups to give up their identities, but it is necessary for these organizations to unite under one banner. A, a United Front should strive to be inclusive, it should wel welcome unionized and unorganized workers while reaching out to youth, women, immigrants, people of color, and LGBTQ communities. While the front orients towards the issues, uh, I'm sorry, when the, when the front orients towards the issues of the most discriminated against, it, it rallies the best fighters to its cause. And when the oppressed push up from the bottom rungs of the ladder, it brings everyone up. The climate change movement needs clear, revolutionary demands and radical leadership that has learned the lessons of the past struggles and revolutions, both successful and unsuccessful. That's what the FSP brings to the table in spades. Our goal is not to be a thorn in the side of, of multinational polluters. We want to build a movement that can win tangible victories and bring about revolutionary changes that will end the exploitation of people and the planet. As a participant in the Occupy Wall Street movement, I saw what the lack of this type of movement can do. When I called the first General Assembly of Occupy Seattle, a united front is what I pushed for. But the movement threw the baby out with the bathwater and decided to disavow formal leadership. Without de dedicated leadership, without po common political ground, and without democracy and inclusiveness and in decision making, the movement was easily crushed by the police. I hope that a united front that fights for climate justice does not choose leaderlessness as a model because we just can't waste more time on that failed strategy. I look forward to the discussion tonight and invite you all to sign up for our study group on eco-socialism where we're going to be applying Marxist analysis to e uh, ecological issues. I think you can sign up at the front desk. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, please uh, make sure to do that before you leave. And um, now I want to end with this eco-socialist call to action. Workers of the blue planet, unite. <laughs> Thank you.